Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this week's What Comes Next Live, coming to you an hour earlier than usual at 4 p.m. London time. And it's not because my guest is going to the Chelsea Flower Show afterwards, but it was really because I was going out to another event. So we shifted a little bit. I, my guest uh, today is Lee Robertson, um, uh, who is has a long and storied career in wealth management and financial services um, and made a big pivot from that a few years ago to launch uh, an award-winning members platform called Octo. Um, we got to know each other around the start of the Octo journey, some really interesting stuff, um, fascinating to watch it go. And um, welcome, and I've appeared on, on the Octo <laughs> pod a while ago, so we've done this reciprocally. Um, so welcome, Lee, how are you? Listen, I'm very well, Tom. Thanks for having me on. And as you say, we've, we've both got something to go to this evening, so something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Apart from this. So, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and beyond what I've just said. And then, as always for our guests, it's about half an hour to discuss whatever is on your mind. Okay. Um, long story short, I'm a Scot. I uh, grew up in the northeast of Scotland, so I'm a, a native Doric speaker. So I shall anglicize quite happily for you, for the listeners and viewers. Um, I wasn't a brilliant scholar, um, was always interested in the outdoors and doing other stuff. So I ended up joining the Royal Navy at 16, um, had almost 10 years there, really enjoyed it, um, uh, which is interesting because you, you end up being indoors a lot, but you felt like you were outdoors because you were doing stuff. Um, coming out, I ended up falling into, as many of my generation did, falling into financial services. I was actually going to be joining a civil service department. They were mucking around on start dates and you've got the suite and the Navy had processed me out. So I ended up doing direct sales in financial services, realized there was ever, virtually everything about direct sales I didn't like, but I did it for a year. Went off, uh, joined the Halifax Group as a mortgage broker. They promoted me quickly to manager. Then I went through that usual thing of bank assurance, thinking that everything the bank did for clients, if I did the opposite, I might be a decent independent. So I became independent. Then I set up my, my wealth management independent practice, uh, probably eight, well, it's over 20 years ago now, but I sold out of that three years ago really for lots of reasons in that, you know, I was in my fifties. I didn't know if I wanted to continue, you know, doing what I was doing. I, I developed other interests outside financial services, but still really keen to be involved. Um, so I'm guest lecturing, visiting lecturing at the university. I lecture a lot. I mentor people. I'm a board advisor, you know, that usual portfolio of what we get into our later fifties. But, but the big thing that I'm really excited about is Octo and, um, I, I co-founded it with some friends, one from the marketing side of financial services, one from the investment side and me from the wealth management side. And we started it with the idea that um, maybe we could all to, talk to each other digitally. And this is before the pandemic, of course, but maybe we could talk to each other digitally, share ideas, share best practice, showcase good people, showcase, showcase um, great learning and, and learn a bit about each other along the way. I think sometimes financial service is a little bit siloed. Hmm. Uh, the IFAs think they know everything. The investment people think they know everything, and they think they're more important than the than the marketing people. But I thought if we all interacted in one space, that there might be some some benefit for for clients down down the line on that. And here we are, sort of three ish years later, almost three and a half thousand members. Uh, everyone in here is from the financial services ecosystem. We've got advisors and wealth managers and insurance people. Um, marketing people, investment people, as you'd expect, fund selectors, discretionary managers. And it's a very, very vibrant community. And we, we all learn together and we interact a lot. Hmm. Okay. And what was the what was the gap you, you and your friends saw um, that had you launch this? Yeah, do you know, it's, it's a tiny bit of real estate, isn't it? Um, what, what I thought was um, there were financial publishers already. Mm -hmm. There were uh, professional bodies already. There were forums already, but many of them relied very much on, on a slightly older model. They relied on events. They, allowed, they relied on selling tables and, and that kind of stuff. And we thought with modern technology from a startup, we could just interact really quick, quickly with each other um, mm -hmm. in a digital space. And we went through that process of, shall we just do it on WhatsApp? Shall we just invite everyone we know on WhatsApp? And then of course, you realize WhatsApp has its limitations and it's hard to segment it. And everyone, not everyone, but some people have different different boundary levels on WhatsApp as to what's acceptable and not. I shall leave that there. Um, we went through the thing about should we put it on Facebook? 
Should we look at LinkedIn? Well, we thought Facebook, it was around about the time of Cambridge Analytica and all the issues they were having over privacy. Mm. We thought that wasn't right. LinkedIn, whilst we all use LinkedIn, and, and you know I'm a big user on you are as well, Tom, it, it, we felt it had a bit of limitations and it was hard to keep those that we didn't want involved out. So we, we, we eventually settled on a private social network where, where people opt in and we can decide if they're in or out. And if they misbehave, we can ask them to leave um, or we can just remove them. So the little bit of real estate was um, a digital space between all everything that existed already, really. And, and it was no more, no more well thought out than that. Wouldn't it be great if more and more of us could interact digitally? And there we are. And then the pandemic hits. And of course, lots of people who were doing events and publishing and all those other things suddenly had to go digital. But for us, it's sort of, we felt, reinforced our original thinking that a hybrid approach was the way to go. And, and as, as the world becomes ever more connected digitally, uh, we felt that kind of justified our early. Hmm. Okay. And yeah, it's it's an interesting thought around those being online as to who owns the platform is is one element. Um, but also, yeah, you you mentioned about recognizing the niche, well, large niche, but niche area. So having inviting people in and making sure that it's a a space for people in that with the understanding of what it is. Um, to play, uh, whereas you don't have the same control if you're on any of the big platforms. Um, no, and no, you're right. And, and you know, I, I don't want to knock them either. I mean, let's say we're on LinkedIn, but I, I wake up every day, as I'm sure everyone else does, to emails that have very little to relation to what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. Some of them become really quite passive aggressive in that you don't reply to my last email. You, know, you must be interested. I think, well, I, if I was interested, I would have been in touch. So I think there is a lovely bit about Octo, in my opinion, anyway, in that it almost self-polices. You know, I, members can direct message each other privately, just like having a private WhatsApp. But we, he, we hear, hear very few instances of that being abused by, let's say, fund salesmen or technology providers trying to sell to the members because it self-polices and people, people either mention it or they just block them, which is another thing they can do. But it happens very rarely. And I, and I love this self-policing positivity that goes on within all. Hmm. Okay. Um, but also, I mean, another, you know, thing for people to who, who may be thinking of something in a, their own field is you didn't look to develop, you didn't make what's a common error, look to develop a custom app. Um, you, you took a, you know, there, there are existing platforms that you can just license the use of and put your own front end on. So you, you did that with one of the more common, with one of the more frequently used ones that works very, very well. So. Yeah, we did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I hadn't heard of it before I went down this journey, you know, and I sort of thought we'd end up using Facebook because they were launching groups or whatever they called them at the time. But then Cambridge Analytica broke, mm. um, and I got hold of I got hold of the the founder of the platform we use, and, and she was boarding a plane in the states, and I wanted to customize what they had already, um, mm. and that's a big ask. You know, she didn't know me from Adam. Um, you know, she's she's based primarily in the states, so they operate globally now. Um, and this, this Scotsman was on the phone holding up her boarding her plane saying, I want to use your app, but I want to change fundamentally how, how you think it should be used. And I want lots to say over the roadmap. And, and you know what? She was incredibly, like, like many entrepreneurs, she was intrigued. And she said, yeah, okay, um, I'm boarding a plane, but I promise to call you when I land. And she did. And we had a long discussion. It wasn't the only discussion we had. And, and Andy Brown, my business partner, who I give huge amounts of credit to Andy Brown and all the input he's done within Octo. Um, he and I flew out to San Francisco, to Palo Alto. And, and I always I love to tell this story because a Andy is also Scottish and he, he runs the money side of the business amongst many other things that he does. So we went to the beating heart of America's fintech um, community in just outside San Francisco. And he booked us into basically what I describe as the Bates Motel. Uh, it was one of those horseshoe shaped two story motels with a plastic garden chair outside every room and a Coke machine, Coke vending machine at one end and an ice machine at the other end. And, and it always makes me smile, but we had this fantastic meeting with, with the platform we use over two days um, where we met the chief technology officer and we met the chief, um, you, know, the, you know, everything, the customer success people. I mean, Americans have these titles, but they, they were just fantastic people, very candid, very entrepreneurial, intrigued by what we wanted to do, which was to take a kind of membership platform and turn it on its head to a platform where membership was free, but by supported by contributors who, who also believed in, in, in the kind of mission that we, we felt we were on. Um, and, and so I, I couldn't have committed seven figures 
and counting to building a platform or to find that it didn't work or it didn't do what I wanted it to do or the technology suppliers let me down. I, I have to say the platform we use have been fantastic, incredibly can do. Sometimes the roadmap doesn't quite get delivered as soon as you hope. But hey, even if you were building it yourself, that would happen, I'm sure. Hmm. Well, that's a fascinating story. It also reminds me, of, um, makes me think of, you've got to be good, you've also got to be lucky sometimes. And timing, um, you can never predict timing. A friend of mine years ago um, bought out uh, a special risk insurance brokerage um, less, than, less than a month before 9-11. Wow. And what happened there um, for, for people who don't know that, that market is that then insurance premiums went through the roof for several years, which given that brokers get a percentage of the premium, if the premiums double, the brokerage commission doubles. So all of a sudden the business is worth, well, simplifying, double what, what they paid for it a matter of weeks after they bought it. Um, yeah. So that particular platform you're using, I, I forget the name of it, you'll know it. Um, but I, when you launched Opto, I'd come across it three times in three months because it was just at a point where people were really beginning to use it for different membership platforms. Um, yes, yes. So you, you catch them at a time when they're like, yeah, just great timing. So um, beyond that, beyond that um, for, for lay people who are not involved in, in, in this space, um, what's the if we it is a highly specialized field financial services wealth management ifas independent financial advisors in the uk language um if, if you go back to why they called ifas for people outside the uk one of the big things up until what 30 years ago was that a lot of people looked independent but really tied to certain products and services so people were not necessarily being given the best possible product they would be given the best product for them out of the subset that that person was contracted to sell. A bit like going into an old fashioned pub that only sold beer from one brewery. Um, that, that all got, a lot of that got changed and torn up after you know, many years ago. Um, but I guess the thing for me is about information and sharing and learning. So what's the, what's the benefit to somebody waiting on a pension um, or you know, of just let's drill it back down to, to, to nuts and bolts. What's the, what's the real, benefit of good information exchange to the man on the street in financial services? Okay, it's an interesting one. I, I love this question because I think more information should beget better decisions. Yeah. Because the more informed you are on a topic and the more rounded an opinion that you can form, um, that should help. But of course, too much information or particularly information presented in a particular way. And I think financial services has a real track record of presenting information in a way that they feel works for financial services. Hmm. It can confuse the end investor. It can muddle them up. It can from time to time mislead. Um, and there's been, there's been, sadly, there's been a long track record of that in financial services. So I think we're, we're in this age. Um, and I love this phrase about the democratization of information it used to be, within financial services, if you came along to me, you were paying me for what I knew. Okay? Mm. And I had my elbow, my, you know, a bit like, you know, you know, the guy in the school that would never let anyone copy it, um, always had his arm around it, whatever he was working on, on his screen. Right. And I think financial services are very like that. We were the keepers of the information and we drip fed it out for a cost. Whereas now, and I, I used to genuinely say this to clients, there is very little I do for you as a client that you couldn't do yourself with the time and the application and the discipline. Now, yes, certain parts of the technical bits you're never going to learn, but beyond that, very little. Hmm. But of course, so it, information is a democratization. People understand it's much more open now. Um, it used to be you got an annual statement. Now you can get a statement 24 seven online, on your phone, You know whatever your investments are worth, what's it gone, what's it done, what are you invested in, why are you invested in it, all that kind of stuff. So I think information is really important, but it has to be, it has to be delivered by the financial services industry responsibly and equitably. Hmm. So, so on your, um, given your members will have access to a lot of information already, and you talked about um, both in terms of the founders all from different related, all within financial services yeah. ecosystem, but from different backgrounds and part of it is learning from each other and that rounded knowledge is valuable. Over the few years that Octo has been running and growing, what are the sorts of areas 
that people that your members are looking to get information on and are there any have there been any surprises in there for you um not not especially i mean the, the first thing i would say the big surprise the pleasant surprise was that people wanted to join and stay yeah. and interact so that was a great surprise but in terms of knowledge it sometimes depends where the um which part of the financial services ecosystem the member comes from. If they're a wealth manager or an IFA, they are always, if we look at the viewing and reading and listening stats, they're always interested in compliance and regulation because that's a hygiene factor within their business. They've got to do things right. They are typically very, very interested in technology and how that can make them more efficient, how they can better serve their clients. They are very interested in personal and professional practice development. How do they make sure their team is well motivated, well maintained, very client centric, etc. If you come from the investment side, you've very often got very different drivers. You're interested in um, portfolio construction, what the fund managers are thinking. The, you know, whenever greenwashing pops up, and you and I have had this discussion about greenwashing. Uh, whenever greenwashing pops up, the investment community are all over it. They're very interested. And there's something posted yesterday, and I can see lots of the ESG commentators on Octo. And the investment community have got involved in that debate. So it will depend on which part of the ecosystem. The lovely part is no ecosystem, no, no silo within the ecosystem stands alone. They all overlap to a certain degree. And it's in those overlaps that Andy and I really wanted and Rob really wanted to help, hopefully, help with understanding. And, and a, a fundamental part of Octo's genesis was Andy and I sitting on a sofa um, talking about things. And we often used to comment that we, we both arrived with the same driver, which was, if we wouldn't do it for our own mother, we shouldn't do it for anyone. But of course, I came from the advisor side, he came from the investment side, and you have preconceptions about what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, well, it's, it's you know, a with profits fund, it's all paid, it's hard to understand what's going on. Um, you know, you hold bonuses back, but you don't know if they're being held back for the right reasons and all that. And he would then explain what that was. And he would say, the thing about advisors are XXX. And I would say, well, actually, that's not right. There are, there are compliance issues that we have, there are regulatory issues, there's duty of care, whatever that was. And those little overlaps is, I think, where the learning and understanding um, happens. And I, and I think that's been the lovely thing on Octo. And even when we do our live events, which have been virtual through lockdown, the discussions we had on what we called our virtual drinks on Wednesday evening, we had someone on the virtual bar stool. And we, boy, did we stretch that virtual drinks um, analogy. But it was just lovely have people from marketing or branding or advice or ESG or whatever it was just doing a little slot and everyone got to pick it apart from their own point of view and I think we all learned along the way. Hmm. Okay so that's that's very cool and so it's it was very interesting to hear that those drivers from that conversation that you and Andy had way back uh, a few years in um, you know it, it it's successful um, the, and they'll I guess the thing for me is one of my key questions is what comes next? Well, in one way, I mean, we, we exist, we aggregate and curate other people's content. Right. Because it, uh, as part of our mission, uh, and I always talk about the three, the three um, cornerstones of, of the three-legged stool within our business. The content, there's the community, and there's the commercial, because you, know, you still have to keep the lights on yep. to deliver this service, and we have to keep the lights on. Um, the content is largely aggregated and curated from other sources. Um, and if we think it's interesting, we ask for it. Or if we have supporters, progressive firms who like what we do and want to give us content, we, we come to an arrangement of what's suitable. We don't want fun fact sheets. You can get fun fact sheets anywhere. What we want is managers thinking. What we want is um, you know, somebody talking leadership. What we want is somebody talking about the latest tech that might help advisors be more efficient in their practices or whatever. Mm -hmm. and those are the things that we want to deliver. But we also create content and we love to spark debates. We love to see what the members are reading. Then we go off and find more about it or we get a panel session together. And we, we sort of feed off. There is a symbiotic feeding of what, they, what, the reader, what the members are engaged in and what more of that we can deliver. In a way, I almost think we'd like to do less creative content and let, and let the members contribute their own content. But the flip side of that is it's incredibly interesting to talk to someone or to see what the members are engaging with and go, you know what, we can dig a little bit deeper. We can, we can actively go off, as we did last year, I suppose, in our Festival of Innovation, because there was lots of discussion about how you invest in innovation. But what does innovation actually mean? And what does it mean in the context of technology? What does it mean in the context of, of um, 
you know, ESG? What does it mean in the context of AI? What does it mean in the context of education? So we were, we were just blessed to be able to go out. We were supported to do so. We went out to lots and lots of different people, subject matter experts, and, and did interviews with them. And, and we really picked that apart and it went down incredibly well with them. So whilst I think in a way it would make our life easier if we just relied on the curated, aggregated and, and, and contributed content, hmm. In a way, it would take it would take some of the fun of my job out because I love to go off and talk to people like you about leadership or you know and get you on top for talking about these things. It, it's incredibly satisfying part of the day. Hmm. Okay, so it's a broadly curated, uh, but the model. I mean, the model you're running is also include. You know, you go deep on topics. Um, it occurs to me it's a little bit like um, uh, this, this sort of blended model. Is a bit like if you look at Channel Four, the news the well the fourth original broadcast channel in the UK, um, which of course through through various politics that have been going on, people have become more aware, and I really wasn't aware of it before, that it doesn't receive any public funding whatsoever. Um, it's fully funded by its own commercial activities, but by charter, in terms of competitive charter, because it was given a broadcast channel, it's not allowed to make its own content with the exception of news, um, which is fascinating. Um, so how does it go deeper? Well, I guess what it does is it will look at that blend of um, its communities, its list, is its audience. The second store is the content, and the, the third store is the commercial. It will look at the blend of, well, can we get can we get sponsorship or advertising around this? Um, and then also, um, you know, actually then saying, well, where do we go deeper? Like, where, where do people? What do people want to see? So. Um, you're a broadcast network in, in some degree. <laughs> yeah. well, do, do you know, I, I really like the analogy, Tom. Um, you know, we, I, I, I like Channel 4. There's lots on Channel 4 I don't like, but I really like these Scandi detective series, you know, The Water Presents and, and stuff like that. And it always says Water Presents sponsored by High and Dye or, or whoever it is, you know. Um, probably not High and Dye, but you, you yeah, yeah. get the message. And, and that is rather like Octo. You know, some, something gets delivered. At the bottom of an article, you may say, um you know uh contributed by a sponsor that what that what that sponsor is doing is fulfilling the role of hyundai they're helping us keep, keep delivering out uh, and we're very careful to disclose that to our members and we we have a big balance of contributed and sponsored and created content but that's not a bad analogy in a way particularly since a huge part of our output is actually multimedia as you know it's videos <clears> it's <throat> Yeah, and it's it's not the same as what in those magazines what used to be called advertorial, as you're saying. You're not just throwing out a fun fact sheet because that's one of the fascinating opportunities and challenges, right? Because so much, as you noted earlier, so much information, particularly in the in the space you're in, it is available to Joe Public um, for free or next to free. Um, so it's got to be about different things, and I particularly like the idea of crossing over areas of the ecosystem. When I started traveling to, you know, doing different things around the city of London many, many years ago. Um, you know, I, I've always been a generalist, I've not been a specialist. And I did find it quite staggering to, to, you know, come in and look at one of the original offshore fund accounting systems that we developed on laptops in the Cayman Islands and be 25 years old or something and, and go or less than that and walk into what was Merrill Lynch's headquarters in London, which basically had its own area code, <laughs> like yeah, several yeah, yeah, thousand yeah. desks. And finding there were like 100 people I was addressing off the plane aged about 24, saying what we'd worked out how to do, because actually three of us are computer scientists by training. Mm. This is the days way before this is now whatever every bank has, they have people providing in house systems. And we were, we were doing this and there were literally 100 people just going, we had no idea you could do that. And it was me and another, another person in the office who were doing it. And it just really, it was my wake up to go, wow, people can be really specialized. And that's so sometimes it, you can go very specialized and deep and sometimes you can be a generalist but if you so a real learning i'm taking from something you said earlier was there has to be you know that you can't go if you go too broad then you lose relevance so it's like finding that sweet spot of cross-pollination of ideas between people from different areas um, and still being relatively specialized there has to be a sort of sort of um baseline of, of understanding before you 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 come into that into Octo, you have to understand um, what is operating in that space of providing um, investment services, whether it's the investment side or the advisory or wealth management side, you know, yeah, you, don't really you don't explain, you know, the basics to people. 
but you want to, no. it, it's a bit, bit above that. Yeah, and, and everyone in, inside Opto is within financial services to some degree within the ecosystem. They will have a level of understanding, be it, be it at a really high level or in a, in a very, very deep level or more generalist, and that's absolutely right. The other thing, of course, within Opto that they can do is they, they can customize what they, they get access to. Of course, to. yeah. If they're not interested in a particular topic, let's say they're just not interested in portfolio construction because it forms no part of their day-to-day -day activity, they can just switch it off. If there's a particular chartist that, that, that likes to publish charts on Opto and they just get no value from, they can, they can just mute that particular individual. So it's, it's a very malleable, um, powerful system. Mm -hmm. But yes, you're right. Um, I mean, I, although I, I would say, I mean, I was a generalist advisor to a big degree. Um, and that was made worse by the fact that I, I've got a real interest in marketing and brand building and, and those other issues. So that also took part of my family. And I love, I love generating new clients. So prospecting is a big thing that I love to do. Um, but you do need subject matter experts. And Absolutely. the lovely thing about Octo is we have lots of subject matter experts who will opine on, on a subject. And I'll say the ESG thing that popped up yesterday, already I'm seeing, you know, recognized subject matter experts. Um, uh, giving their opinion of what the man from HSBC said about ESG in Miami. Yeah, very topical. I try not to be topical on these shows, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> very senior guy <laughs> in HSBC basically uh, effectively was laughing at the idea that we have a climate crisis. Right? And I just can't believe he wasn't kidding. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> well, I, I think it was a professional audience um, and yeah. it, was, it, it, was, it was probably aimed in a particular way. It wasn't meant to be yeah. reported verbatim, which is one of the reasons we don't have journalists within Opto. Um, uh, we have them if, because they write for us and they've signed terms with us. Hmm. But what, what you don't have is journalists on there who, who might, uh, for all the right reasons, might feel they can take a comment that's made within Opto um, to a to a professional audience and take it outside. So we we just we just our members didn't want them in, so we just took that decision. That was right. Yeah, that's, I mean that's a, a opening a, a small um, a small version of what could be a much longer conversation. Is mm -hmm. I remember in the late two thousands uh, for a network called Global Scott that I'm a founder member of that the Scottish government set up twenty something years ago, um, going up to conference center in upstate New York um, for a sort of North American thing. And 90 of us were there and a whole bunch flew from Scotland. And there'd just been an election in Scotland. And um, the, the one of the, well, the number two in the party in power came and addressed this room of 90 business people. Um, what was fascinating was that they, they said things that they would not have said publicly, but it's not a matter of keeping secrets, but they were speaking in the language of the audience. Right. If they were saying things on TV, they would have been misconstrued or understood, but they could filter what they were saying. And there's the recognition that, that none of that's going to get, you know, reported verbatim. Um, so the, the perhaps forgive, slightly more forgiving take on the HSBC guy was that uh, perhaps the absolutist version of um, getting out of extractive industries is not necessarily tremendously realistic. Um, and that's, the, that's actually, you know, my view would agree with that, but you'd want to be able to frame it um, to an audience before it gets stuck onto the front page of the newspapers. Um, and so that goes just taking, it goes back to your, you know, what the Octo has a, a sandbox that people play it. Which yeah, I, I guess that's, that's not a bad way to, to talk about it. I mean, that's why regulators, whenever regulators make speeches to the financial services sector, they read from the speech and nothing more because they, they want not a single line to be misconstrued. And I suspect politicians, although they're forever going off script, but I suspect lots of politicians, you can see, can't you, when they've got a message they want to get out, they all come out with the same four or five lines. The, the prime minister was at a party. With, sorry, I'm being toppled again. But yeah. you know, they, they trot, you will see six or seven different people, commentators, all, all using the oh, yeah. exact same words because that's the message they want to get out and to resonate. And that, that's more like um, news cycle management. And in, in, on Twitter, you'll see in that, you know, one you mentioned, you'll, you'll see again and again, 15 people in that political party with the exact same tweet going up. Yeah. Um, no, but many years have passed. But the example I'm giving was basically newly elected government comes across, talks to Scottish and diaspora Scott business leaders and effectively say, this is the independence minded party, the SNP, who got back into power. And uh, number two, the head of uh, John Swinney, who's the number two in the party, basically said, 
something along the lines of we, you know, hand, cards on the table, we want an independent Scotland, but we don't want it until we know we're going to do the best job running the country economically and looking at the business elements and sustainable business, etc. And we, we need the backing of the business community for this. Right? And if you're not going to give it to us, then then we have no leg to stand on. Right? But they're not necessarily, that's many years on, and it's a very understandable thing to have said, but there's no way they would have used that line in front of um, the teachers union in Scotland, who are notoriously radical, for example. Yeah, or, yeah, or, or, or probably not even on Newsnight. You know, they yes, exactly. Yeah, they but just it actually used that line. That candor, and it didn't feel like a line. It felt genuine. Converted certain people to go. Okay, we'll give you, we'll give you some space. Um, you know that. So yeah, it is. It's so yeah. It's very interesting when you, um, yeah, the, yeah. I'm just thinking about that. So when you go with it, the the audience you're looking for. So. Anyway, so there you are. You've got, uh, apart from going to the Chelsea Flower Show this evening, you've got this uh, ongoing thing and you love making the content to go deep yourself. And so you're at some level the, the channel for of, of uh, financial services news, but you do, uh, but with a note that you actually do your own online events as well. And um, with uh, when you mentioned hybrid, I mean, it was, it's you know, a little bit of an accident that you were an online thing at the time when everybody needed to be online. Um, but now, now the city is flourishing again. Uh, maybe not five days a week at the same level of tube use as before, but certainly flourishing. Um, do you have plans for um, in-person events and stuff, or has that never been part of the plan? Um, it's a good question, um, and I might be able to see a bit more by the time this has gone live. But you know, we, we've always had we've always had bits and pieces where we meet people. You know, we film in the studios, we've done panel debates here. We're, we're based in Wapping in some fantastic studios. Uh, we did we did a, an event um, earlier this year where we had fund managers being grilled by a fund selector in front of a, an invited audience who had lunch. So we do nibble around the edges at it. So, and I suspect as people go back to the office, I think even for natural introverts, and no one ever believes I am, um, we we've kind of missed human contact in a way um and, and i you know i've rather enjoyed walking up to the city it's a 10 minute walk up to the city and i did it yesterday to meet people that i've not seen for a long time um, it, you say this about tubus we we met for a, a diet coke and a sandwich in a very very what used to be busy um picture and piano and i think you know, us and the other two men having lunch outnumbered the staff, I think. So that was a bit sad to see, hmm. but then but then it was a Monday and Mondays in the city are now very quiet, whereas Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays are busier. So um, I'm waffling a bit around the point, Tom, but I suspect, watch this space. We've never been against having physical events. Hmm. The last two or three years have kind of, for all the reasons that we all know, have maybe got in the way a bit, but we've done them in the past and we may well do more of them. Uh, we will go where our members want us to go. And if members say they'd rather meet up and do some stuff in person, then it would be wrong of us not to not to consider that for them. Cool. Well, it's been um, terrific to to hear more of the story and uh, perspectives. And um, certainly if you're learning from me, I will uh, watch this back again later and make some notes, which uh, rather than focusing it 100% on, on our conversation. Um, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. So uh, as always, I like to give my guests or closing thoughts. Um, what are your closing thoughts for us, Lee? Closing thoughts. Um, I think it's never it's never too late to earn new skills. Uh, and this is something that I've had to do with Octo. Uh, I'm doing parts of the job now that I never envisaged I would have to end up doing. And I, I think never, never resist your natural curiosity. And I think that serves people well in life in their families, particularly if they're entrepreneurial, um, never resist your curiosity, curiosity about, about product, platform, people, process. Um, and and that's, that's the thing that I've been blessed with, a natural curiosity that I love to follow and, and learn things. And I, and I think that would be, that'd be the thing I'd love to pass on to people. Uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure viewers of this podcast are of that type. You know, you, you're, you're 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 broadcasting to a community of the interest and i think we, we probably share that that we're eternally curious people brilliant um i put it in a very sort of americanized three-letter acronym the abc of leadership always be curious yeah yeah absolutely um, it's been a pleasure thank you very much lee thanks tom thanks for having me cheers